Hey guys, what's cracking? Godsman here, coming at you with a video that is a channel first, that being a video regarding the anime. Now, to be completely transparent, I'm really surprised that I haven't done a video like this yet, given that the anime is one of my favorite things about the game, and one of the big reasons why I got into the game in the first place. But uh, hey, here we are now, right? And to start, I decided that an interesting topic to do would be a top 10 list for the many, many, many card fights in the series, as really there are just a ton of good ones to go through. I know top 10 list doesn't seem like the most original thing, but uh, hey, gotta start somewhere, right? I uh, decided this was something that had a good foundation relative to a lot of other potential video topics that are a bit more out there. I do intend to get to those as well, but hey, let's start with something a bit more digestible. Now, having said that, it might seem odd that we're starting off with Asia Circuit, for those of you who have seen the thumbnail and read the title, uh, rather than the first season or even the Link Joker arc. And to be honest, I'm starting here because this was the season whose rankings most really came to mind for me. No cap. But that aside, Sir Asia Circuit does tend to get overlooked compared to other seasons, so this particular topic felt a bit more interesting to delve into as the flagship video for this miniseries for the top 10 card fights, if you will. Anyway, let's set a couple ground rules for the video. Of course, only card fights that took place during the season are eligible. Furthermore, uh, said card fights need to have been on screen, so no fights mentioned off handedly, off screen, that kind of business. That just does not count and it's not very interesting. Finally, this is a ranking based on personal preference, and will take a lot of factors into consideration rather than simple fight action. With that said, let's delve into the list. I hope you enjoy. Number 10. Kicking off this list with the first of two tag battles, actually, we have Aichi Misaki vs. Terrence and Philip, which took place during episodes 87 through 88. So, when mulling over the card fights during the Asia Circuit arc, it was pretty difficult to figure out which games would round out the lower end of the list as there were a few good number of games with that felt like they could have made it on this spot uh was debating quite a while actually but ultimately i went with the tag battle against terence and philip uh, the big reason for this is twofold first off the card action was surprisingly solid in retrospect with lots of back and forth and cool moments such as aichi riding palinor and misaki carrying the tail end of the game in fact, that leads to the second reason, actually, which is Misaki's performance in this battle. One of my gripes with Misaki as a character is that she tends to be underutilized and has her potential squandered at some points due to the lack of good card fights, among other things. Fortunately, this game was fantastic for showing off her strengths as a player, that being her ability to manage resources and effectively anticipate the opponent's plan of attack. Misaki's ability to defend the duo and gather resources when it was necessary was what ultimately led to Key 4 seizing the W and was a great moment for Misaki's character. Although it's far from the best of the season, this game still makes it in at number 10. Number 9. Next up we got one of the last games of the season, that being Aichi vs Christopher Lowe Round 2, which took place during episodes 99 through 100. I'll be real chief. I don't really like Christopher. Hell, no one on his team really appeals to me either. Great nature stood out to me as a clan, and none of the team genius members were interesting or unique. That said, this fight still had to make it on this list for the two units that it introduced. Battler of the Twin Bush Polaris and Platina Ezel are both great. Although the action and character interactions were serviceable, it wasn't anything special. However, when Christopher rode Polaris and gave his famous line about the third strike of Polaris sealing the game, I was admittedly kind of intrigued. That combined with his earlier prediction of Aichi taking three damage and that turning out to be true made the fight neat and I found myself questioning legitimately just how Aichi was going to turn this around. Then came Platinum Ezel, the glorious upgrade to Ezel, which was a cool reveal and felt fairly satisfactory as a means for Aichi to break through Christopher's freaky predictions. It's not an exceptional game by most standards and probably wouldn't make on a lot of other top 10 lists if not for it being this specific of a uh, topic, but Polaris and Platinum Ezel being introduced saves this match for me and puts it at the number 9 position on this list. Number 8. Coming up next is a match that a lot of people probably forgot even happened, that being Kote vs Goki. If you forgot about this game, I don't blame you. It happened during episode 86 and was a pretty quick match that went down right before the beach episodes following the soul stage of the tournament. In other words, it happened in a pretty forgettable lull between stages. That isn't a knock against this game though, as it's a pretty solid match all around that was interesting for a couple reasons. 
For one thing, this is a matchup that had yet to happen in the anime and featured two of the most earnest and vibrant card fighters in the series up to this point. So in that way, we as an audience knew we were in for a pretty entertaining fight. And it didn't fail, as seeing Goki encourage Kote to find his resolve to tread forward fearlessly was amazing and really put into perspective just how much of a positive force Goki is as a character. Another interesting factor was that this lesson came as Goki was having to contend with what was by all means a brick of a hand through clever use of the drop zone to superior ride through the grades. Having to deal with all that and yet still push Kote to the point where he needed Great Daiyusha to pull out the victory gave me a whole new level of appreciation for his strength and resolve as a character. Uh, although the point in the season where it played did it little favors and the game itself was rather short, Goke uh, versus Kote is still a gem of a fight and definitely deserves its spot at number 8. Number 7. At number 7, we have another Masaki fight. That being Asuka versus Misaki, which took place during episodes 80 through 81. This game was a part of Team Alo4's rematch with Team Q4, and is the first of several entries on this list that feature members of these teams battling each other. So, although this fight is pretty good overall, and the interaction between Asuka and Misaki is also pretty freaking good, my reason for why it manages to nab a place on this list is uh, admittedly a little petty. See, another one of my gripes with Misaki is that while the other characters in the series were getting their new super cool limit break units, she continued to use plain old Tsukiyomi. It was like she refused to grow and power up and it led to most of her previous fights feeling like the same old story, right down to the ones where she ultimately lost because these tired tactics just weren't keeping up. Her battle with Asuka was the straw that broke the camel's back though. Misaki gets decimated in this game, unable to do so much as make her opponent break a single sweat. The severe level of humiliation from losing to an opponent she had worked so hard to surpass previously was just the wake-up call Misaki needed, and shortly after led her to switching to her witch deck, which made for an upswing in her character. So yeah, basically I love that this forced Misaki to finally give up Tsukuyomi, which sounds horrible, but I don't care bro. It was getting old and Misaki needed a glow up, which she did thankfully. That said, the fight lags behind most of the other AL4 versus Q4 fights due to it being basically just a wake-up call for Misaki, which, while great, is something that the other games further on this list accomplish while being more entertaining and interesting overall. That said, Misaki vs. Asuka is good enough for number 7 on this list. Number 6. Moving right along to the next AL4 vs. Q4 game, we have Kamui vs. Tetsu in episode 78. So, just like with the previous fight, this fight serves the same basic purpose of being the wake-up call for Kamui, showing him that his current skill level is enough to carry him through the Asia circuit. This is good stuff, of course, but why put it above the previous entry? Well, for one big reason, character history. See, unlike Misaki, Kamui failed to defeat his final opponent in Season 1, which was Tetsu. This meant that Kamui still had unresolved beef with the man, and we as the audience feel a sense of anticipation in rooting for Kamui to finally overcome this exceptional player who's seemingly always one step ahead of him. Of course, uh, we don't get to see that victory just yet as Kamui gets blown out of the water in this game. So the continued rivalry of Kamui and Tetsu is already enough to push it slightly higher. However, if I'm being honest, there is a level of personal bias here. When I say that seeing Tetsu play again to show off his new units was more interesting than in the case of Asuka. Nothing against Asuka, of course. It's just that compared to her tactics, which was basically the same song and dance of calling from the soul, hell, even potentially a little bit less interesting because it was just a main phase field board presence. That was about it. Watching Tetsu menacingly build the soul in an aggressive manner before building up to his explosive limit break was overall a bit more engaging. Kamui was also entertained to watch in this game, having to attack desperately in the hopes of beating out the clock to Tetsu's inevitable final turn. Seeing this kid, who was previously near infallible actually as a player, be filled with absolute fear on the field against Tetsu was a treat to watch and made the fight that much more intense. That said, these games are similar enough in their premise and fight action that they deservedly rest alongside each other, with Kamui and Tetsu slightly higher at number 6. Number 5. Just cracking the top 5 is the second tag match in this list, Aichi and Kamui vs Leon and Charlene, which occurred during episodes 90 through 91. So uh, from this point onward, 
the list will be going over the games that are the most memorable and the best the season has to offer fittingly the top five this game being no exception of course and how could it be i mean there's a lot to love here for one tag matches have already been previously established to be an intricate and intriguing form of battle with the number 10 game on this list being present in part because of just how fun tag matches are to watch however this match far exceeds that one due to the greater action and character exposition that it presents leon as a character was not a new entry in the series as we've known about the kids since part way through the season prior but it wasn't until this game that we truly got to see just how strong he and the aqua force were the tag team of aichi and kanwi the two high-powered players of q4 just being completely overwhelmed by the sheer strength of the aqua force duo was an excellent way to sell the power of this legendary fleet in addition to great back and forth with both the action and the characters we also get solid lore here as leon explains more about the history of the aqua force uh another very satisfying moment was leon pushing aichi to finally use his psychqualia making the fight and aichi's loss feel much more legitimate overall than a couple of the previous matches he had also, it was the debut game for the coolest and perhaps the most iconic Aqua Force unit, that being Blue Storm Dragon Maelstrom. Gotta love it. This game does a lot really well and honestly has little flaws other than not being quite as epic or iconic as the next four matches on this list. Still though, it takes number five by a mile. Number four. At number four, we have the best AL4 versus Q4 match of the season, which is Aichi versus Bren. Occurring alongside Misaki and Asuka's match in episodes 80 and 81, this game was, to be frank, freaking amazing. Being the villain of the previous season and a fan favorite character to boot, Ren returning seemingly out of the blue was such a hype moment and made the anticipation for this rematch hit sky high. And oh boy, it did not disappoint. The action is great, the interactions between Ren and Aichi are pure gold, the music is well placed, and above all, Ren is just a complete goon. Seriously, he easily stole the spotlight and wiped the floor with Aichi, having fun and messing around to the point of comedy while doing so. Although it does fall victim to the oh, Aichi lost to Psyqualia pattern that had been forming, it doesn't impact the match too hard for me because there's a lot more to love here. Just like with Tetsu and Asuka, Ren's fight here is meant to humiliate Aichi, to the point that seeing Ren dunk on Aichi so hard makes me genuinely laugh every time, and it pushes him to improve. That said, this game does far more than that. After all, Ren's character is dramatically different here, his vicious and villainous personality being replaced by a youthful, almost innocent one. This transformation makes him feel strange, almost like a complete different character, and the fight serves to reintroduce to us, the audience, who Ren Susugomori is. On top of that, Ren's deck is really cool. One moment that struck out to me in this regard is when Ren told Aichi that he thought his gold paladins were way cooler than Kai's units. And I agree, 100%, mind you. Seeing this Spectral Duke ride line in action was great, as a perfect blend of Ren's old Shadow Paladins, that being a ride line and effects with retire rears, being seemingly, like, just seamlessly integrated with the gold paladin methods of calling more rears from the deck and working towards a massive limit break from the Spectral Duke Dragon, which, by the way, is one of the most iconic and epic limit break units in the game. For those of you who know, my bias for both Ren and Spectral Duke Dragon should be readily apparent, but even without that, this game would still make it high on the list and easily takes number 4. Number 3. This may or may not come as a surprise, but at number 3 I actually have Kai vs Leon from episodes 101 and 102. The reason that this may come as a shock is that this fight might have been seen as a shoe in for the first or second position on this list, but let me explain why this isn't the case. I agree that Kai's Gray's games are great, right? The man is an absolute unit, and he really adds flavors to his games, and that really does help carry this match all the way up to number three. However, there's always been a problem that I have with this game that hurt it in my eyes, and uh, that was how similar it was to Kai versus Ren from season one. Let's break it down. First off, the circumstance here is similar, with Kai being this undefeated god of cardfighter, now having to face the main villain and ultimately lose to him in order to hype up their strength before Aichi beats them right after. It happened with Ren, just as it did with Leon. And the way in which he loses is also damning. Kai, fearlessly facing the opponent drunk on the power of Psyqualia, reveals his cool new cross in the blood, and proceeds to strike back. 
he ultimately fails to kill, and on the next turn loses to Leon's super duper cool cross ride, Glory Maelstrom. Sound familiar? That's because it's the same exact scenario as in Season 1 with The End and PBO. It's almost as if it's the same fight, except it's modded out to have reskinned character models and different dialogue. And his loss doesn't even feel that significant, as he just gets booted from this weird limbo space the characters are battling in and leaves Aichi to just beat Leon immediately after and save the world regardless of Kai's contributions and failures. It's honestly pretty sad to see Kai get clowned on and play second fiddle to Aichi here, but uh, hey, I guess him deciding to just become the bad guy himself and get his own evil cheater juice in the form of the reverse and start smashing the main characters himself in the next season kinda feels justified now, huh? Uh, hot takes aside though, this game is still good for what it is. Really, the main highlight here goes to Leon as well. We get his full backstory in this battle, and it's pretty depressing, not gonna lie. That combined with Glory Maelstrom, one of the chattest upgrades to an already epic unit being revealed in the final turn does make this fight very entertaining in its own right. That may only take the bronze due to the redundancy of the match in hindsight, but that's still a worthy position on this list. Number 2 Taking the runner-up spot is Aichi vs. Leon, the season finale fight which took place during episodes 103 through 104. So depending on where you stand, this may feel a little high of a placement for this fight as people don't remember it quite as much as the previous game or the number one game on this list, but let me explain. See, while this game isn't quite as memorable, this is, in my opinion, mainly due to it not being an introductory game to a hype unit. Glory Maelstrom and Platina Ezel were already revealed in their matches prior. And although this game is the only time Aichi has a one-on-one -on -one versus Leon, note, he's only ever played against him in a tag match previously, it doesn't feel like their first confrontation due to said previous tag battle. If we're really wanting to dig into the game, some could even argue that it's like the previous entry in that it's a simple copy of its Season 1 equivalent in Aichi vs. Ren. However, this isn't a fair comparison. See, unlike that game, Aichi is thematically in a different place here. He doesn't whip out a brand new unit in MLB and shows off the power of light and darkness intersecting. Instead, the boy plays Platina Ezel, a unit shown previously, which is, for most intents and purposes, a unit of light. This shows Aichi's growth in adopting the path of light and showing this light to those gripped in darkness such as Christopher and Leon. And, uh, mind you, even characters such as Reverse Naoki and Kai in Season 3. He's no longer straddling the fence and resolving eternal struggle. Now he has the confidence of self to focus on the struggles of others and help them conquer their darkness just as he has done with his. Hence why he can use Psyqualia without being taken over by it. On top of that, there is technically a unit reveal here in the form of Blaster Blade Spirit, a surprise unit that, to be real with y'all, hit me harder than the blood. The music that plays here being the same as when IG beat Red in Season 1 is a really cool throwback, and the subsequent action of Ezel and Blaster Blade working together is an awesome way to show IG's Gold Paladins turning from this seemingly ragtag off-brand version of Royal Paladins into a noble clan on equal footing to the previous glory of said Royal Paladins. It also helps that Aichi would continue to use Gold Palettes in Season 3, but I digress. Overall, it's not quite as hype of a season finale as with, say, Season 1 or 3, but compared to the games in its arc, Aichi vs. Leon is still great for the Blaster Blade Spirit reveal and the growth it shows in Aichi as a character. Although I can totally get why others wouldn't put it here, I personally place Aichi vs. Leon at number 2 on this list. Number 1 and now for the moment you've all been waiting for. At the number one spot is a game that many might have deducted by this point, or rather deduced. And that is Ren vs. Kote in episode 82. Like with Kote's game against Goki, this fight only lasts one episode, but holy crap, it was a banger. Seriously, this fight does everything right. It feels perfectly paced and takes just the right amount of time to conclude with little interruption from the supporting cast in between. The action is intense and unique due to the rule in place by the tournament. The characters are both entertaining and have good dialogue. And best of all, the buildup and subsequent payoff of this game is impeccable as seeing Kote, a man who always fell short against Ren in the competitive scene, finally breaks through and sees his victory through bravery and determination. This was incredible to see. 
Going more into detail, this game stands out for several reasons. As already mentioned, the rules are a bit different. For those of you unaware, this rule was only allowing each player to stand three rear guards during their stand phase in addition to their vanguard. This made the game feel more tactical as both Ren and Kote had to find their own way around the limitation in place. On top of that, we've also established just how different Ren is character, and seeing the new Ren battle against another of his rivals is a treat to say the least. Speaking of which, this game is the only one in which we see Ren play a completely different deck from his usual Paladin decks. The man literally whips out Dark Irregular in the middle of a tournament to the shock of everyone, myself included. And you know what? He rocks it with the deck, dude. His carefree and secretly menacing personality adding the perfect amount of tension and spice to his plays as he builds up to his win condition Bladewing Ragey, another fan favorite unit, mind you. It's the only time we see him play DI though, so seeing him employ the strategies that he does with the soul and Ragey is a one of a kind experience and makes the fight unique to watch every time. But of course, the moment that really propels this match to number one position is Kote's final turn. It's just peak Vanguard, bro. The original Vanguard theme playing is awesome and energizes every aspect of this turn. Kote top decks the guard he needs to superior cross ride the great Dayusha and combines effects to power up his final strike. Hell, even just the mere addition of Dayusha speaking as he swings his sword and Kote's speech on justice prevailing is so immensely satisfying. It's just the best. I also love Aichi as a spectator here. This man was getting inspired, and how could he not? Ren is a player of the highest level and has crushed both Aichi and Kote previously. So understandably, Ren is pretty scary here. Yet Kote still fights bravely and maintains his composure. So yeah, that makes him a top fighter in his own right. This culminated in his epic gamble on the Great Dayusha, and the aforementioned speech clearly hit Aichi and put a fire in his belly which would help him to continue along his journey. In that way, it perfectly illustrates how Kote helps inspire everyone on how to be a hero. He didn't just break through Aichi's fears, but his own as well. Although Team Caesar would ultimately lose the match, which was kind of lame. Kote and Ren put on a performance of their life and break through to the top of this list. And that was the list. So, what did you think? If you liked it or just want to expand on the analysis presented in this video, then do be sure to comment down below. Also, use the lovely comment section if you want to let me know what you would change about the list. Are there any fights that I missed or is there anything that I missed about the fights that are in the top 10? You know, just uh, give me a heads up. I hope this video to do well, and should it do well, then you all can expect a sequel. That said, do let me know what season of Vanguard you would like next. I'm open to the OG series, G, B, hell even Overdress, so just let me know, I'm pretty flexible. Currently, though, the next one will probably end up being Legion Mate or Link Joker if no one has a suggestion on the contrary, but again, I'm free to being swayed, so please do. With that said, if you'd like to see more Vanguard content, then subscribe and check out my other videos, and turn on that notification bell to tune in for future uploads. And with that, take care, God bless.